Good morning uh, and good afternoon, depending on, on the time zone. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Xavier Pasco. I'm the, the director of uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique, Foundation for Strategic Research, uh, the main uh, French think tank on uh, international security and defense. And I'm very happy to welcome you all uh, to this seminar dedicated to uh, the debate about the future of multilateralism and uh, the role of like-minded countries, uh, specifically the role of Japan and the European Union. Um, this webinar is indeed our annual conference of our Japan program, which has been uh, running since 2016 and aided uh, since then by Valérie Nicke, um, uh, who is a senior fellow at FRS. Uh, this program is intended to uh, deepen and, and feed the intense strategic dialogue uh, that has developed between uh, Japan and France. And over the years of, uh, of running this program, it's been shown that how much Japan and France have in common when it comes to analyzing uh, the dynamics of international relations uh, at a time when the world scene is, uh, has been largely been aff affected, uh, has been largely affected by transforming great power uh, policies, uh, raising, of course, as we all know, many challenges for the whole international community, and also questioning uh, the role of multilateralism as an efficient tool to keep a global uh, dialogue alive. So for this reason, and this particular conference to me comes at the key moment uh, to help us analyze the perspective for a renewed multilateralism supported by like-minded countries uh, such as Japan and France. So we will have uh, uh, three roundtables today uh, devoted to understanding uh, the shaping of our uh, international environment uh, to better understand the role of international organization in this uh, uh, process and uh, to better understand their evolution, especially uh, after the, the recent uh, changes uh, uh, at the level of the great powers uh, um, uh, power uh, uh, and, and, and systems, and, and uh, uh, to also focus on the role of economic partnership uh, in the post-COVID recovery. So we will have uh, presentations of about 15 minutes each, uh, with some uh, remaining time for questions. And I, I really uh, uh, appreciate that the, the, the fact that you can ask these questions by using the, the chat uh, button and we will make our best as chairs of these roundtables to reflect these questions to the speakers. Uh, I now open the first roundtable about the role of Japan and, and, and the EU uh, in, in the shaping of the strategic environment. And I will first give the floor to Professor Rishi Osoya. Uh, good, mor good morning, good afternoon, Professor, uh, uh, from Keio uh, University. Uh, professor Soya is professor of international politics and uh, uh, is very, uh, uh, um, has a lot of expertise uh, in, in uh, analyzing uh, the, the processes at stake in here. Uh, professor Soya has also had uh, been member of several panels at the prime minister level in Japan. So professor Soya, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Pasco. Uh, for your kind introduction. And also, thank you very much for the organizer of this event. I think that this event, the topic of this event is extremely timely as important because we are now at a kind of a crossroads or a turning point in, I think, global history. So what we will do, uh, what we mean by that is what both Japan and the EU are going to do from now on will, I think, define, will define the future course of international relations. So in many ways, I think that uh, EU and Japan are important players in the world nowadays. And also now we are in a turning point in global history. That's why I think that the topic today is extremely timely. And I'm very, very glad to be part of this great event. And I will talk about the importance of Japan or both Japan and the EU in the future of multilateralism. Uh, I, I will talk uh, about that, why, why, why this is important to think about the role of Japan and the, the role of EU in, in, in thinking about the future of multilateralism. 
I will talk particularly, I will focus on a, a couple of points in, in, in the beginning. First of all, I like to emphasize the importance of normative partnerships uh, uh, between Japan and the European Union. Of course, Japan and the EU are not uh, a, a strong military power, and the size of its uh, defense budgets are not huge, as huge as the United States or uh, China. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Japan and the EU are generally defined as uh, civilian powers. But uh, Japan and the EU are not just civilian powers, but at the same time, some scholars of the European Union studies are saying that the EU is a normative power. So that's why I think that the Japan is willing to support uh, the norms which the European Union have been uh, trying to promote, such as democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, and, uh, lib uh, and uh, 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 free trade and so on, freedom of navigation and so on. So in the sense, I uh, would say that uh, the both Japan and the EU are trying to consolidate these important norms by enhancing the partnerships. Uh, the reason why uh, the partnership, normative partnership between Japan and the EU is important is that in the world, there are three unilateralist countries, or uh, more or less, these three great powers tend to become, tend to be a unilateralist uh, a power. And the three powers are naturally the United States, China, and Russia. Uh, these are three uh, great military powers uh, which have a huge uh, amount of weapons and uh, uh, military budgets. But uh, on the other hand, uh, EU and Japan have different kinds of international identity, different from these three military powers. Uh, rather than that, rather than simply relying on these military powers, I would say that uh, both Japan and the EU are uh, heavily rely on its a civilian power. Civilian power means, of course, uh, economic power and uh, culture power and so on. So that's why when I think when the EU and uh, Japan signed EU Japan EPA and the SPA, SPA is Strategic Partnership Agreements, I think that the, the two powers, the European Union and Japan, uh, are, are located in a special place to construct multilateralist and rule-based international order. So in the sense, the EU and Japan are leading players in the world in consolidating, creating, and consolidating a rule-based multilateral international order. Uh, this is one thing. The, the, the second thing that I want to focus on is the importance of in, uh, increasing, expanding, uh, EU's and Japan's role in the world. Previously, Japan is interested in just surrounding areas such as China, Korean Peninsula, and so on, East China Sea and South China Sea, and at most ASEAN countries. And at the same time, I think that the EU uh, is emphasizing on its neighborhood policy, uh, looking at the surrounding countries. But on the other hand, nowadays we are seeing the expansions of the role of both EU and Japan. I would say that both Japan and the EU are now global powers uh, relying on its civilian method or uh, civilian tools. So particularly in the in the Pacific region, both powers, Japan and the EU are now trying to become a kind of a, 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 a leadership, trying to have a leadership role in creating, as I said, multilateralist rule-based international order. So in that sense, I think that the EU and Japan are now enhancing its role in the Indo-Pacific region. At the, at the part, on the side of Japan, Japan has been, as you know, encouraging and expanding a, a free and open Indo-Pacific vision. On the, on the other hand, EU has been promoting its uh, Asian connectivity strategy, not just the EU, but uh, France, for example, and Germany, and recently the Netherlands are focusing on its in the Pacific strategy. Of course, France is playing a very important uh, leadership role in creating the European in the Pacific strategy. So we, if we combine Japan's in the Pacific strategy and European 
in the Pacific strategy. I think that the two sides can be uh, can 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 create a much more stable and prosperous regions uh, with these cooperation. And in the end, I like to focus on the importance of the Biden administration because the Biden administration has many things in common with both Japan and the EU. Uh, uh, until recently, I think that both Japan and the EU were quite defensive in trying to uh, defend important norms such as uh, liberal international order, rule-based international order, or the body of multilateralism and so on. But uh, now, the Biden administration of the United States is encouraging us, both Japan and the EU, to promote uh, these values and uh, enhancing its cooperation with both Japan and the EU. And um, furthermore, I think the important role are played by Commonwealth countries in the Indo-Pacific. Commonwealth countries mean Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and India. So Quad is another important tool uh, to, to, to have to promote this kind of direction. Uh, Quad, of course, mean the combination of the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. So now we are, as I said in the beginning, at the, in the, in the, at the turning point in global history. And by combining all of, all of these, I mean the EU-Japan normative cooperation and the framework of, framework of the Quad and like-minded cooperation among like-minded countries by assembling uh, these combination coalitions or partnerships. I think that the EU and the Japan can much uh, in a much better way promote rule-based and uh, multilateralist international order in the world as well as in the in the Pacific. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Osoya, uh, for this uh, very uh, wide and enriching uh, tour d'horizon, I would say. And I really uh, appreciate uh, the, the fact that uh, you mentioned these uh, um, uh, common strategies and, and, and common values, especially in, uh, in the uh, way to uh, cr create and help contribute to uh, normative rules. Uh, we all know, but we will come back to this during the debate, I think. We all know the importance of the commons today, uh, whether they are maritime, uh, cyber, space, whatever. Uh, this will be a very important, uh, um, uh, uh, I would say, uh, asset uh, to, to help uh, regulate all this. So, but we will have a lot to, I think, I, I'm sure, a lot to debate. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will now uh, uh, give the floor to Frédéric Gras. Uh, Federica Gras is a member of the policy planning staff of, of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France and is also being um, um, uh, a professor at uh, Sciences Po and also has been a member of Carnegie and is a well-known specialist on all these issues and Frederic, uh, I will give you the floor now. Thank you very much, Xavier. Let me uh, say that I'm sorry, but I'm no longer working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I'm no longer in the policy planning staff. Uh, I still follow a number of things, but I mean, uh, I'm happy to say so because it also give me more freedom to uh, when I address any of those issues. Let me say, first of all, that um, I'm very happy and at the same time a bit skeptical about what uh, Mr. Osoya said, Professor Osoya said about Japan and the EU as the defining, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the defining power for the future of international relations. Uh, I hope they will. Uh, and I hope our respective government will work to make sure they will. But uh, this remains to be seen. And I would like to insist on one other side. I mean, we like to describe ourselves as normative powers. The Europeans in particular like to do that. And this is true that Europe and probably Japan too are normative powers. But I mean, the que is the question really today about setting up norms? Yes, to an extent, rules have to be made, rules have to be updated in continuously and so on. But I mean, the rule-based order exists and the real issue, at least normatively, and the real issue is compliance. And yes, you're absolutely right to say that none of us are strong military powers, 
uh, our ability to define the future of international relations will be precisely in our respective capacity to ensure compliance through non-military means. And that means a lot of things. And I think that's precisely where uh, our respective Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, Indo strategy um, are meaningful or will be meaningful or will not necessarily be. It is very difficult for me to speak of an EU Indo-Pacific strategy which doesn't exist yet. Although we know now that this is likely to be adopted by, uh, by the uh, EU member states. But what does it mean? And I think that's the most important. First of all, let me insist on one thing. Um, when we speak of Indo-Pacific strategy in the context of the EU, this is, um, how could I say, and weaknesses of multilateralism. Uh, multilateralism is very much in the DNA of the EU. The EU is multilateralism at work. It does promote it outside, but it does leave it on its, uh, uh, in its every way of functioning. Uh, but it's interesting to see how it works in that specific context at a time when the strategic landscape is a bit redefined. I mean, Europe soon to be made decision to adopt an Indo-Pacific strategy or whatever we call it, be it a vision, be it an outlook, be it simply an approach, does mean something regarding the evolution in the way at the strategic landscape precisely. First of all, a vision of China, which is very different from what it was even two years ago. You know, we've said, we've used the word of competitors and systemic rival. This was simply unthinkable two years ago or three years ago. A new sense of vulnerability linked to the COVID crisis. In that sense, we are no different from uh, anybody else in the world. But it doesn't mean at the same time that Europe will stand to be confrontational vis-a-vis -vis China in any way. This is not in its DNA. By and large, what we should look for is sort of a peaceful rebalancing of the relationship with Beijing. And I believe that there we converge because I, that's the way I, I do understand the uh, uh, Japanese Indo Pacific strategy as well, even if we come from very different world and very different uh, background. In the European case, how is it likely to take place? Uh, that's the uh, uh, interesting thing to watch because this is very unlikely to be spectacular in any way, except for at the announcement because everybody will be looking for the political meaning of all this. But the political meaning is in many ways already uh, there on the table. Um, and, and what will be interesting to watch also is the reality of uh, of the uh, elaboration of a strategy, which is likely to be not just a one-off, not just the definition of things that are likely to be set in place afterward, but an incremental process. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you expect to hear anything about uh, or sort of a declaration of hostility towards Beijing, you're likely to be disappointed to start with. If you expect the military dimension to be prominent, in the um, uh, European Indo-Pacific strategy, you're likely to be disappointed as well. Each team that will be developed within the strategy will be developed over time, and they will make sense collectively over time, and there is uncertainty about each and every of them, but we hope that at the end, it will make a sort of web of constraints and engagement processes that will help shape the system and shape China's behavior in a way which is more compatible with uh, international norms. Now, if you look at the state of the debate on the Indo-Pacific today, you will see that some of the most ardent supporters of it, Germany, for example, or even the Netherlands, did not even want to discuss it 18 months ago. So that's something that's changed. If you look in detail, you will see that the team which are being discussed from multilateralism, this is sort of an incantation in whatever we do, but I mean, this is evidently there, to maritime security, to connectivity and investment, align with the priorities 
of all the states which have defined an Indo-Pacific strategy for themselves. What will be the final outcome of this? I don't know. And the question is open as to whether this will be essentially a formal exercise or whether there will be something more meaningful. And what we can do collectively is to try to make sure that this becomes meaningful. And there are a lot of ways to address it. I mean, I can't go into detail into that, but if we speak of connectivity, what do we actually speak about? Again, this is sort of the incantation that has been put forward in almost every conference because this is uh, the most obvious way to try to answer theoretically and practically uh, uh, the BRI and the influence China is getting through it. In reality, so far, not much has been really done which doesn't mean, of course, that nothing will be done. Uh, if we speak of trade, I mean, what kind of trade agreement should be set in place in order to make sure that, yes, there is diversification of the supply chains, that, yes, there is greater leverage on the part of like mining countries and a diminution of the relative importance of China within the overall system. This is what we, in all frankness, are all looking for. And that is something we can start working on and that we're already working on jointly. I mean, in 2018, before the EU even started talking about an Indo-Pacific strategy, we signed uh, uh, both a strategic partnership agreement as well as an economic partnership agreement. Uh, and it was very clear, as I recall, in the mind of Japanese uh, policymakers that this was intended to be part of their strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Europe, of course, would have never said so, which doesn't mean that it never meant to. Um, uh, another thing, I should add also that if we want to understand what will really go on and why there is also uncertainty, is it because you can't just take the action of the commission alone? or the EU per se alone. I know that this is one of the favorite game of all EU partners to divide between member states with, whom, with which they act unilaterally or bilaterally, sorry, most of the time, and the commission on the other side. The reality is that uh, both complement each other. They occasionally contradict each other, but not really. I mean, actually they complement each other. I mean, and if you take a number of EU policies, they have never been uh, especially when it comes to uh, foreign security uh, policy, they've never been operation to a ad hoc coalition the willing apply to one specific uh, situation. And the best example of that is Atalanta, for example, that we like to put forward when we speak of Europe and maritime security. Uh, so this is likely to continue like that. So, Professor, so yeah, you mentioned the excellent relationship with France. It means what? If we look, for example, at the kind of exercise that we have had recently in the South China Sea, anti-submarine uh, anti exercise between Japan, the US, and, uh, and Japan. It means that European states, whenever they have the capability, will look at that kind of triangulation with Japan or with others, and the US, because this is precisely the way of managing things, sending political signal and so on. This will definitely complement whatever the EU does or even does not when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. And this is very much working in the same thing. Every policy is by and large a mix of engagement, deterrence, and uh, containment up to a point, although I know that the term is more or less taboo, but there is a reality to it. I mean, similarly, if you add that to the sort of trade policy that the EU is likely to put, then you end up with a situation where, which is slightly different from the one we see you, you do end up with. If you consider the, each of the policies, then the EU is going, that's the direction, willingly and partly simply as a result of the ongoing dynamic, where it's going to end, I'm not sure, but definitely if you compare two or three years ago um, and now, you've seen a very different situation. I believe that we are going in the right direction, 
How far? I don't know. Is it likely to be frustrating? Probably. Is it likely to be imperfect? Absolutely. But I believe, and this is my firm belief, that yes, we're going in the right direction. And there, there is a lot we can do together. And there are already things that we do together. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick, for this. Uh, I would say a realist and, and maybe lucid <laughs> account of uh, what we can do, uh, of what we can do, especially on the side of the EU. You mentioned rightly the fact that uh, uh, the DNA of the EU is not precisely uh, um, uh, confrontational, especially in the military domain. We all know that the EU uh, uh, has had uh, great uh, uh, difficulties to uh, uh, align policies uh, already in the security domain, which has remained a, a, a domain um, um, reserved uh, to the member states, and it's more the case uh, for, for defense per se. You rightly mentioned Atalanta. Uh, I would have a first question for you, uh, Frédéric, uh, just following up your, your, your intervention. Okay, we, we know that these last years the EU has been more uh, uh, keen on, on addressing uh, um, a, a little bit more precisely, uh, defense, the defense efforts, I would say, that should be done by the European Union and its member states. And we know, for example, that uh, we have now the, the European Defense Fund that has been uh, created to help set up a policy. Uh, you said, I don't know how far it can go. I would say, I don't know how quick it can go. Uh, but don't you feel like there's a, there a slight change uh, con con compared to the, to the recent years? That would be my first question for you. Well, there is definitely not a slight change, but a large change. Uh, the question is, you know, in principle, this is fine, but you said yourself that what we have done so far is set up the body that will precisely help shape the policy. Uh, this is definitely indispensable, but this is probably not enough because we would need to go further than that and actually we do have to some extent structures. I mean, it's not as if we uh, we acted in a vacuum. But yes, I mean, uh, there are a number of things that we 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 can do and we will do. In the specific Indo-Pacific, when we speak of security, we mention we we speak basically of three things. We speak of maritime security. We speak of cyber. Cyber is not my domain. I won't even mention it. But I believe. Yeah, we probably have the possibility for a European approach that will be meaningful. When we speak of maritime security, I mean, look at what we have been so far. France has been active because it did have the assets, and the UK had some assets, but the UK is no longer part of Europe. But there are other countries moving in slowly, in a limited ways, and that tells us at the same time that things can be done, but things will have limitation. When German sends a Uh, Frederic, I think you are muted. Uh, your mic is is off. Okay, okay. sorry. Okay. I said, uh, if we speak, for example, of maritime security, then uh, it, it is a good example of what we can or cannot do right now. Part of the problem is capacities. I mean, when Germany sends a ship, but no more than a ship, it is definitely a progress. It is welcome, and yet. It and we're not going to be decisive either. So we like to look for uh, partnerships elsewhere in the region and so on. But what does that mean also? I mean, uh, maritime security is not limited to the protection of sea lanes of communication. There are a number of other dimensions which are emerging, the protection of the uh, exclusive economic zones, for example. Most of the threats we see emerging today uh, are sort of a hybrid uh, nature. I mean, partly economic, partly, uh, and when we speak of maritime safe or security, we too often speak of non-traditional threat. We speak essentially of piracy, traffic. And so this is not going to change the strategic landscape in any case. Where other things could do, uh, what happens that if we speak of uh, fisheries, if you speak of trafficking of all kinds, be it human, drug, whatever, and if you speak of piracy, you speak more or less of the same 
capacities. You speak of the uh, MDA, you speak of uh, customs, and you speak of coast guards, right? But I mean, there is also a way to use things in a small, less smarter way, and that I believe the Europeans have the capacity to do and do quickly, providing they think the way they change, they think about those issues. If you speak, if you speak of fisheries, for example, you do have the capacity to mobilize politically a vast population in sort of coalition, which would be unlikely if you simply stay uh, in traditional uh, strategic consideration or even political one for that matter. So, you know, we basically have to change the way, and that can be done reasonably quickly. Uh, and there we have the capacity to act. Again, that won't be decided, that's not the whole thing, but this is useful. And if this is useful, this is to be done. Uh, so yes, we have changed, not we haven't changed enough, but we haven't changed enough because we don't realize that we have a potential if we just start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frédéric. Um, I have uh, um, some questions for Professor Osoya. And the first one you I would like you to react to, to, to the discussion we have, and especially about the norms. Um, you rightly mentioned, I think, and I think uh, Frederick won't discuss this, by the way, the importance of normative policy, of the role countries can play at the norm level, at the norm setting level, let's say. Uh, and especially, you mentioned, Frederick, the maritime domain. We could man you mentioned the cyber, we could mention space. We know how the importance of the commons, you know, this is the, the buzzwords. Uh, of today, I think. But still, yes, the question is uh, how uh, about compliance? And so what would be your reaction in, in, in you know, setting up a strategy that could become uh, between the EU and Japan? And, and in, indeed, I think these two uh, 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 international, uh, we, have, we have in common this capacity to act at the normative level, but what, what would be the the, the challenge in terms of compliance, as seen from your perspective. Well, thank you very much for your important question. In Japan, I um, usually regard it as a hawkish realist, but I'm glad that together with Frederick, maybe I can be seen as much more liberal or leftist or so on. But anyway, I'm happy to be so. And uh, well, I fully understand the importance of military power, uh, just as uh, Frederick mentioned. But uh, think about this. Before 1945, Japan was a powerful country, the most powerful country in Asia. Japan defeated Russia, Japan defeated China. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that Japan was uh, really most influential power in the world. Before 1945, Japan was defeated during the Second World War, regardless of the Japanese military power. But after 1945, Japan, I would say, has become more influential international politics because Japan has many friends, many partners, and well, Japan uh, uh, has become a reliable power in international relations. And the power of France, I would say, is not because of its well, nuclear missiles, because of the reliance, reputation, partners, and international institutions. Without international institutions like United Nations Security Council or without uh, France's membership within the European Union or the NATO, and without French reputation in diplomacy or international relations, I wouldn't say that uh, France, just along with its military power or nuclear missiles, can be so influential in the world. So I fully understand the importance of oh, power, new, mi, military power, but uh, military power is just important one dimension of many dimensions of international relations when we, we, we evaluate the power. But I would say that the power, military power, might be perhaps the most important component uh, of, 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 of the evaluation of, of the power. That's why both Japan and France are in international ranking of military budget. Japan and France are within the top 10 because both France and Japan really understand the importance of military power. That's why the two governments and the, power and, and the people of the two countries really understand the importance of spending military budget for that. So this is one thing. The other thing is, as I mentioned, the influence of Japan is not exercised by Japan alone. The influence of Japan can be in, uh, exercised with Japan's partners and coalitions. Japan joins in the East Asia summit, but the United States president, former president Donald Trump didn't attend the East Asian summit for four years. 
without attending in that East Asian summit, of course, the United States cannot influence the direction of the East Asian summit. And Japan also joins in the Quad, the Quad Rattlerall, uh, 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 security cooperation with the United States, India, and Australia. And also Japan joined in a trilateral cooperation with China and the Korea. So Japan joins in so many institu uh, institutions, international organizations. Japan have US, Japan, FPA, FTN, and Japan uh, actually uh, led to create, as you know, CPTPP, the largest, uh, I, I mean, in the, in the region, largest free trade area. And the, much more than that, much more than the CPTPP. Nowadays, Japan EU EPA is the largest free trade area in the world. So Japan, by joining in these kind of free trade agreements or frameworks, Japan can be in a driving sea to define some of the important international economic and trade rules together with the United States, together with China, together with the European Union. So in that sense, I think that the Japanese power can be exercised with, uh, through these kind of frameworks. And about your question about the compliance, I would say that a, a, a great power such as the United States, China, Russia, and so on, India, these powers will be less interested in being abided by rules or international law. So we will be living in an, uh, 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 law of the jungle, not law, no, not uh, 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 such kind of international law, rule of the law, but rule of the jungle. So in that sense, international rules, international law will be less effective in international politics. But if so, we have to increase our uh, defense budgets, but the, both EU and Japan have clear limits in spending military budgets. That's why both EU and Japan have to play an important role to curve, to change the trajectory uh, into the world where uh, international law will be much less important and the military power alone will define international relations. I'm, the, I'm seeing this kind of direction. That's why we have to do something to prevent that. Of course, we cannot maybe prevent that, but maybe we can uh, add some of the other elements in international relations because we are not the barbarians, we are not animals, we are uh, civilized people. That's why, even though military power is important, but well, uh, we have rules, international rules, and uh, we can enhance international rules, but at the same time, we can damage international rules. So we have to create a coalition uh, 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 with like minded powers who are willing to enhance and encourage those kind of international rules. And I believe that uh, France is a leading country to play such an important role, if I'm not wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I remind all our audience that you can use the chat button, uh, the question and answer button to ask a question. And there's one question that's been posed. I have another one uh, uh, also. And, and just following just what you said, and I, I really appreciate this balance, in fact, balance strategy we can have, uh, promoting multilateralism and being realistic. And, and lucid in a sense. Um, and I would have a question uh, 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 about the cooperation that exists between the EU and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Japan on, on piracy. Uh, um, uh, can Japan go further than that? Uh, you know, would it, would it be a possibility for Japan to, 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 to uh, imagine uh, about uh, a, a larger cooperation or maybe something more uh, uh, um, heavier in terms of, uh, of equipment or whatever. Is there a, a possibility for Japan to, and for the EU that's the same question by the way, uh, do you feel like this kind of cooperation can go uh, uh, further in terms of, of, of acting? Yeah. Well, may I answer to your question? Yeah. So do, do you feel like the, this, this cooperation that exists on piracy, for example, in the maritime domain between the EU and Japan, and, and could, go, could go further in terms of uh, action, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 acting okay. on, 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 in terms of security let, and defense? Let me give you one example. 2013, November 21. Uh, November, 20, 20, November 23rd, I remember, the Chinese government declared its own air defense identification zone. And it was against a normal, customary international law because uh, China declared that any flights which were entering into China's 
uh, uh, air defense identification must abide by Chinese directions. It's not territorial air, just, it's just uh, air defense identifi identification zone. That's why some of the even Chinese diplomats are reluctant to uh, defending these new policy. But soon after that, Japanese government and uh, of course United States and other European major countries strongly criticize Chinese uh, uh, behavior. Of course, China is entitled to declare its own air defense identification zone, but it must be accommodated with the customary international law. So if uh, the operation of that Aegis is not uh, 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 adapted with a normative uh, no, normal international law rules. Maybe we have to criticize that. And after huge criticize, after huge criticism actually uh, came after the declaration, China actually Chinese government decided to not actually implement and operate its own declaration in the dome. So both Japanese or American flights can easily and uh, without endurance enter into the zones. So China actually afterwards uh, uh, revised its own declaration to some extent. So likewise, of course, uh, China actually recently declared and uh, uh, I, I actually uh, uh, used a new uh, 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 Chinese Coast Guard law, uh, which actually is not uh, accommodated with our usual understanding of international relations because it uh, uh, can be adapted not just uh, to Chinese territory air or territorial ter 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 sea or EEZ, but even beyond that, China tried to enforce the, those law, domestic law, to other countries' ships, so in the or freight. So in that sense, both Japanese government and the French or United States government and the other governments as well are criticizing those law. So it well because of this, I would uh, imagine that China would refrain from violating some of the important rules by. Uh, uh, using its force to intimidate some of the, the ships or freights around the area. So in the sense, I think that the Japanese government can collaborate with European governments to try to pressure China to be really abide, to abide by uh, a, a, a normal uh, international customary law. So this is my take. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now have a, a, a question from the audience, and that will be the only one we'll be able to, uh, to process. Um, uh, it's for both of you, and I read it. What are the innovations that Japan and the EU can propose to reform the multilateral systems, which so urgently needs to become effective and credible? Saying that a value-based multilateralism is needed is right, but not sufficient to make a change. So what would be, uh, we have uh, three minutes maybe to just to, to give the, the, you know, the, the, the substance of what should be done. Uh, maybe Frédéric, you want to start and we will give uh, the Perhaps, final word uh, to Professor Osoya. Yeah. Please, Frédéric. And I, can answer, and I can answer your question and this question specifically in a, uh, at the same time. I mean, where, where uh, Europe and Japan can probably can Europe and Japan cooperate more in uh, issues such as uh, piracy or whatever? The answer is yes, but not necessarily cooperation. Coordination would be what is needed. What is the problem we all face with and what is the problem which is affecting the effectiveness of the international system? The lack of capacities of a number of countries. I mean, look at uh, the little states of the Pacific. Look at the little state of uh, the Indian Ocean and you see a number of countries which do not have the capacity to simply uh, guarantee their own sovereignty over their own territories. Simply coordinating, training, capacity building in all those states. Uh, and this is something which is relatively cheap, feasible at short term and so on, is a way to uh, help the, the multilateral, multilateral system be more effective. I mean, the rules we have, of course, will, new rules will be decided and so on, but again, uh, we need everybody to be able to better contribute to that. I mean, the sort of small scale coalition which are emerging now. We mentioned earlier Japan, France, US in the South China Sea. Uh, that can be built up in order to reinforce the system. 
we we are seeing, for example, uh, France, Australia, and India cooperating with each other in order to help. Uh, Made the uh, made the original organization in, in ocean more effective. This is this is this logic that may actually help uh, 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 oh, contribute to make the the multilateral system more effective. And this is a logic which is at work. It's going to take some time. It's very imperfect. It's still nascent in a way, but this is already going on, and this is likely to continue. And I believe this is a good way to help the system being more effective. Sorry for being a little confused. Okay, thank you, Frédéric. And Professor Soyai, your last word, please, concise, so that we can uh, stop our first session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, China was previously repeatedly criticizing IMF and uh, trying to reform it, but the United States didn't uh, agree with the Chinese request. That's why China actually created its own bank, uh, AIB. So uh, China has been criticizing some parts of the international system and India likewise and ASEAN is also criticizing some, of the, some parts of the international system. So uh, we have to refuse some of the requests which are not legitimate, which are not appropriate, but we also have to listen to some requests which are legitimate. Otherwise, these parts, like such as India or ASEAN and uh, China or Russia, they are not willing to support these international systems. So international relations is now uh, become much more multi-civilizational. So in that sense, I think that we have to listen to some of the legitimate requests to reform uh, the current uh, international system. So this is, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you, Professor and, and Frederick, uh, for this very uh, uh, interesting debate. And I think it's uh, launching our conference in the, in, the, in the best way. So I will not stop there. Um, there are some other questions that have been posed. I think they, they will be posed over the, 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 the duration of our conference. Um, I will stop there. We have a five minute break. And then my colleague Bruno uh, Tertre, who is Deputy Director of FRS, will chair the second session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Euh, merci à Bruno et merci à tous les trois. Donc, euh, je vais vous demander de couper votre micro et votre caméra. Et euh, dans quelques minutes, nous allons commencer la prochaine. Euh, we will start, sorry. Uh, in a few minutes, we will start the next uh, roundtable uh, with uh, Bruno Tertre as a moderator. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Bruno Tatra, I'm the Deputy Director of FRS, and I'm delighted to chair this uh, second session. We will welcome uh, Kiyotaka Akasaka, who's a former UN Secretary General for Communication. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And we will also welcome Ambassador Céline Jorgensen, our good friend Céline. Hello and good morning, Céline, from Rome, I believe, uh, who is uh, not only the permanent representative of France to the FAO, but also to the other organizations located in Rome. They, uh, well, they uh, both have uh, different and complementary perspectives and experiences, I believe. And so we are eager to learn from them about how international organizations have been able to adapt uh, to uh, COVID-19, besides the mere fact that uh, we all, most of us are working from home. Actually, that's my case. I don't know if it's a case for the participants. But apart from that, how have international organizations adapted. Um, uh, Mr. Akashaga, I will give you for first, since you are first on the program, if that's okay with you. And we're ready to listen to you for uh, no more than 15 minutes, please. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. As you all know, well, multilateralism is now in grave danger. It is so, not only because of the harmful America first policies of former US President Trump, but also because of the disarrayed and uncoordinated international response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, an increasing number of political leaders of many countries, big and small, tend to ignore both international norms and international organizations, such as the UN and WHO. 
World Health Organization. The proclamation of America is back by President Joe Biden is welcome, it is indeed good news for multilateralism. But the dangers of multilateralism dangers of multilateralism losing its global significance will not be entirely abated as challenges to multilateralism are still numerous. The coronavirus pandemic has revealed the strengths and weaknesses of the international governance in global health. The role of the WHO in coping with such pandemic has been the subject of heavy global debate. Initial criticism against the work of the WHO mainly came from two aspects. First, Director General Tedros's perceived favor towards China. And second, lukewarm actions taken by the organization. The first concern about the personal leadership of the Director General is not anything new in international organizations. The second question of the institutional reaction, however, is related to the constraints imposed on the WHO Secretariat by member states. Those constraints include the international health regulations and the lack of sufficient regular budget. The current international health regulations do not, I repeat, do not give sufficient maneuverability to the Secretariat. Moreover, many member states do not always follow the regulations as faithfully as they should. Also, an increasing share of voluntary contributions to the budget is unpredictable and geared to specific programs. In order to strengthen the organizational ability to cope with global pandemic more swiftly and effectively, the amount and the share of assessed regular budget needs to be greatly increased. Therefore, in fact, it is not the WHO Secretariat, but rather member states that are largely responsible for the lack of effective global response to the pandemic. Yet, people and the world media than to make the WHO a scapegoat for the failure. The initial global criticism against the WHO has cast important negative effects on the views of the Japanese people about the UN as a whole and the WHO in particular. The Pew Research Center of the United States conducted an opinion poll in 14 countries during the summer of 2020, last year, on the WHO's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. A median of 63% said that the WHO were, has done, had done a somewhat good or very good job dealing with the outbreak. Many European countries were in that group. In those most uh, developed countries, including the United States and European countries, a majority of people appreciated the work of the WHO, with a notable exception of South Korea and Japan. 80% in Korea and 67% in Japan express their negative view on the work of the WHO. The Pew Research Center's poll also observed the same sharp drop of the Japanese people's favorability 
of the United Nations to 29%, striking the low, 29%, the lowest uh, level among the 14 countries surveyed. This may have reflected the increased unfavorable views of the Japanese people on the work of the WHO. Why have Japan and Korea shown such high levels of negative views on the WHO? First, the Japanese press has reported extensively on the international criticism against the WHO Director General Tedros handling of the pandemic in its early stage. He was perceived as favoring China and delaying the announcement of the state of emergency. Later, then US President Trump criticized the WHO vehemently, calling it a puppet of China. Many Japanese people have followed these pieces of news and criticism against WHO attentively and the image of the organization has worsened. Second, people generally underestimate the challenges which the WHO is facing in its operations and its financing. The fact that the international health regulations do not give sufficient maneuverability to the WHO secretariat is not well known by the public. WHO is also short of regular financial resources to move quickly at the time of crisis. When things do not go well, people tend to point a finger at the organization not to real culprits of member states. However, pandemics death rates, excuse me, moreover, the pandemic death rates in Korea and Japan have been much lower than in the United States and European countries. As a result, the self-confidence of Koreans and Japanese people to control the pandemic on their own efforts without particular assistance of the WHO must have played some psychological effect on the polling. It may be a bit preposterous and arrogant if they think that the WHO was useless as far as they are concerned. The growing confrontation between the United States and China over the WHO, the UN Security Council, and other international organizations have also played an important part in worsening the crisis of multilateralism. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres lamented the current state of multilateralism, stating uh, his fear about the world splitting into two. As far as the WHO and other technical specialized international organizations are concerned, I believe there is no fundamental reason why the United States and China cannot cooperate each other. Indeed, China is not a keen supporter of the existing multilateral institutions and the values embodied in them. However, over the years, China has shown great eagerness and interest to cherry pick multilateral institutions or their activities, so long as they suit their interests and are useful to them. China is ready to work with the United States or other countries in multilateral institutions so long as it is useful for them. The feud over the name of the pandemic and the personal handling of Mr. Tedros was not, was not an insurmountable problem. That was not a big problem. More fundamental issues such as reforms of the 
international health regulations and the need to increase regular budget could be addressed through vigorous bilateral or multilateral negotiations. Solution to them are urgently needed and I believe they are possible. Now that America is back or almost back to multilateralism, this may be the best chance to revitalize the multilateral institutions, which have been weakened over the years. The future of multilateralism still seems precarious, but nonetheless, it is not hopeless. The Japanese people are well aware that if the merits and the merits of multilateralism were compared on a balance sheet, the merits would overwhelmingly outnumber the merits. There is no alternative to multilateralism in order to solve global issues like climate change, infectious diseases, refugees, terrorism, and nuclear proliferation. The WHO is one of the most important UN specialized agencies, and the EU the countries excuse me, EU countries and Japan have long been a staunch supporter. In view of mounting global agenda and the incessant appearance of new infectious diseases, the EU and Japan, together with many partners, including, of course, the United States and China, are expected to help revitalize the WHO. Already, some European countries, I know France and Germany included, have initiated reform plans of the organization. And Japan will surely join such efforts, normative activities, to reform the organization of WHO. Japan once enjoyed the post of the WHO's leadership, Dr. Hiroshi Nakajima was the director general of the organization from 1988 till 1998. He was criticized for the lack of visions and communication skills, but did a good job in addressing communicable diseases such as HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, leprosy, and polio, as well as tobacco control. Japan may want to regain the leadership leadership position of the WHO in the future, as it is proud of its own record of public health and infra its uh, infrastructures. Japan should and can work together with the European Union and other partners to play a more active role in addressing global challenges. In recent years, the Japanese government did take some important uh, initiatives in supporting multilateral efforts such as in such areas as trade, a free and open Indo-Pacific, peace building in Africa and the environmental agenda. And now there are growing calls from many corners of the world. Japan, in concert with other like-minded liberal democracies, should take global and regional initiatives to maintain and strengthen smart lateral institutions. I am confident that if the WHO regain its importance and effectiveness in dealing with pandemics and other public health problems, the favorability of the WHO among Japanese people will be quickly and greatly lifted. There is no need to be overly concerned about the worsen the perception of the WHO and the UN among the Japanese people. Rather, rather, actions, concrete actions to reform the operations of those organizations should be the first priority. Thank you. Thanks so much for this very uh, precise and sobering also assessment. Uh, thank you for the reality check vis-a-vis -vis the United States uh, and uh, the uh, 
uh, very strong words, but I think very appropriate words about the uh, WHO in particular. Uh, Celine, uh, I understand your connection might not be very stable, I'm told. Is it, uh, can we test it for the sound? Your video is okay. Can we just test the sound? Yes. Um, uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well with a slight delay, but that's totally okay. So, Celine, you have the floor for, for about 15 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Very happy to be here uh, today. Good to see uh, good friends and uh, very happy to be in this uh, meeting with uh, Mr. Kiyotaka Akesaka. Uh, very pleased to meet you. So thank you for this um, assessment. Um, I will have, I will say, a more maybe practical vision um, on the ground here in Rome, how we see uh, as a diplomat um, currently the, the trend in uh, multilateralism. So mainly I will concentrate my intervention on the, on the consequence of the pandemic on multilateral work with, um, with mainly um, uh, three points. So the first one is, uh, um, is about the consequence, so as I said, on the multilateral work and action. Second point will be more on a geopolitical consequence uh, in a more brief way than uh, um, what has been said by uh, Mr. Uh, Akazaka, who has uh, already explained a lot of uh, very important issues. And the third point may be uh, more uh, the consequence for uh, diplomatic services, diplomats on the ground. How do we adapt uh, to, the, uh, to this uh, pandemic world? And uh, as uh, Mr. Akasaka said very rightly, uh, the crisis, the pandemic, is uh, clearly an accelerator of uh, the trends in multilateralism, revealing uh, forces but also weaknesses. So what are concretely the consequences on the multilateral work uh, seen from, from here? Uh, I would say that there is a mixed assessment. Uh, multilateralism uh, has continued to work but I would say minimally, uh, even uh, if there has been some success. And for example, uh, in Vienna at the IEA, uh, the first resolution on Iran since uh, 2012. International uh, organization, their team, their management have adapted rather quickly, I would say, uh, to the virtual um, world. Um, they have also learned lessons uh, for the future regarding reorganization and efficiency gains. But uh, I think that we have to acknowledge, um, and it's very true in Rome, uh, that intergovernmental work in this uh, pandemic, virtual world, is uh, much more complex, with more uh, abrasive negotiation, uh, so a hardening uh, in some way of uh, multilateral work, a more complex coordination, and it's particularly true for uh, EU partners, very difficult to have negotiation uh, virtually uh, with EU partners where we have to coordinate on time uh, virtually. Um, there is also a blurring of lines between permanent missions and capitals, which also contribute to the hardening of uh, the negotiation, because of course we have, uh, you know, the big, uh, the big voice of the capital behind us, so we have to stick to the position. So there is a, a hardening, and in some organization, the taboo uh, to the passage of uh, to the vote uh, has um, has been dropped in in, uh, in some organization. Another trend is that the pandemic, the crisis, increased the proliferation of meetings, in particular informal meetings. So it increased the acceleration of the multilateral work and of course the virtualization, which is a heavy trend to which we will have to continue to adapt. Uh, multilingualism is very difficult because precisely of this acceleration of uh, informal meetings. With regard to the response uh, to the crisis of international organization, Mr. Akezaka has already uh, 
um, uh, detailed a lot uh, the response, for example, by WHO. Uh, and um, to concur with uh, his assessment, the crisis is really a reality test, an efficiency test for international organization. We, uh, the relevance of international organization has also been judged uh, to their ability to provide efficient answers to develop solutions uh, that meet uh, this uh, pandemic uh, crisis in the short term, but also uh, in the medium term. Clearly, there have been uh, some success, uh, for example, with the delivery of uh, detection kits, with, uh, for example, um, flights by uh, the World Food Programme, uh, which is uh, based in Rome here, uh, with also uh, many scientific and research cooperation programs. So we should not forget uh, those success. But uh, there are, of course, uh, difficulties uh, in uh, coordination. Uh, of course, field missions we are, which are not possible um, anymore. Uh, last uh, consequence, I would say, um, on this uh, multilateral work is, of course, the development of uh, big data, which was already a trend but has increased. Uh, big data in uh, health and in, in agriculture, in, in, in many issues, which raise, of course, uh, challenges in terms of uh, management, collection, protection of security, uh, and governance, governance of data among international organizations. And I, I would say that uh, in, on that issue, uh, we are still at the beginning. There is no real policy uh, for data protection, data governance. We are still, still struggling with this issue. For example, at FAO, member states have just asked uh, FAO to, to develop a, um, a cross-cutting policy on data collection, data governance. Second point of my intervention is uh, the, about the geopolitical consequence. So, um, as uh, President Macron and uh, Minister Le Drian have uh, underlined, the crisis confirms uh, the importance of global public goods in diplomacy, in multilateral work. And um, saying that they are more important uh, means also that they are more uh, subject to competition. So, uh, strategic competition, battle for influence, information warfare, uh, also concern um, uh, directly uh, public goods. The pandemic has allowed um, strategic action, opportunistic, opportunistic action of certain uh, actors uh, domestically and uh, on the international arena. And of course, this is the case for, for China, but also um, uh, for Russia and other uh, actors. In the short term, and Mr. Akazaka has, um, of course, uh, underlined this point, the issue is uh, the health response, coordination, the international response, equitable access. And the challenge is equitable access to vac vaccine, but also treatment, prevention, care equipment between rich and poor countries. There is a, a, a difference of calendar between uh, North and South countries which is um, a challenge, not to say a, a problem. Most countries in the southern world will have to wait for a decentralized production. Together with other uh, uh, partners, uh, France launched uh, the ACTA initiative and its COVAX facility uh, with this objective precisely uh, to develop, produce uh, equitable and universal diagnosis, treatments and vaccines but a uh, challenge remained. Beyond health challenges, uh, we are facing um, uh, the uh, spectrum of uh, famines. And here we are more, uh, this is more the work of the Rome-based agencies. And we see uh, this uh, very huge challenge uh, clearly. Uh, the executive director of the uh, World Food Programme, David Bisley, was at the Security Council on the 11th of March, and he stressed very much this point. Um, um, armed conflict together with uh, climate change and COVID pandemic threatened to push more than 270 million people to the brink of starvation. 
um, in 2020, the world responded and acted, so we avoid a uh, catastrophe in 2020. Uh, and just to give you a few figures, uh, in 2020, the WFP, so the World Food Programme, which won 114 million people with life-saving assistance, which is the highest annual total in, in their history. But David Beasley, the head of the WFP, has warned that millions of people are really this year sliding toward the brink of starvation. Um, the, pro the, the projection for 2021 are clearly shocking. Um, for example, in the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo, um, um, this is uh, said to become the world's largest hunger emergency with 21.8 million people facing crisis, emergency and catastrophic levels of food insecurity, up 40% on last year. Um, of course, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, many countries in the world. And as the UN Secretary General has described uh, on this UN Security Council meeting, in 2021, famine is a real and dangerous possibility in over 30 countries. WFP estimates that 34 million people are marching toward the brink of starvation. And as is often the case, children are uh, the ones who uh, suffer the most of uh, this uh, pandemic. And WFP expects an extra 6.7 million children to suffer acute malnutrition in 2021. The closure of school has, of course, uh, impact, very negative impact on children. And this is why um, uh, recently, beginning of March, President Macron has, um, has very much supported uh, the call by WFP to launch a coalition on school meals programs to answer to this uh, huge challenge, especially for girls. Um, in the medium term, we can anticipate in-depth uh, effects uh, uh, in, uh, in geopolitical uh, arena, which are still difficult to evaluate. I would just give two examples. I think that we can anticipate an increase um, of um, uh, an accentuation of inequalities, uh, especially for, most, uh, for the most fragile um, states. And second, uh, what we see is an increasing interconnection of issues. And I just take the example of health issue. Uh, this is the concept of one health, which is the interaction between animal health, human health, and uh, environmental health, uh, which is uh, uh, being dealt by WHO, OIE for animal health, uh, FAO, uh, and also uh, UNEP environmental program. So this is why, for example, France, together with uh, Germany, uh, is pushing for the creation of, of a high-level uh, panel uh, of experts on One Health issues to deal with this uh, growing uh, interaction. And of course, there is an increasing need uh, for uh, international organization to cooperate and to coordinate and here uh, on the ground it's still difficult last point uh, of my intervention the consequence on um, diplomatic um, services in terms of uh, hr management working methods and i will be uh, quick on this point, but I think it's very important because, of course, diplomacy is about men and women. <laughs> so uh, we also need to take care of, of them. The French MFA did a survey uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. And uh, again, the, the assessment was, uh, was mixed. There was a feeling of uh, utility um, uh, by uh, people on the ground uh, to respond to this uh, crisis, to this pandemic. It was really a, a, a big challenge uh, for all, all teams everywhere. Uh, so there has been a good adaptation of the teams, but now with the, you know, with the, the crisis, uh, uh, being installed in the long term, or at least in the mid term, we see some, uh, you know, lassitude. 
um, there is the need for ultra vigilance because of this uh, virtual uh, world, uh, which is quite difficult. A risk, an increasing risk of isolation for some, uh, of course, some um, some individuals, which seems all the more paradoxical in a very connected world. And um, we have seen also very concretely the need to uh, accelerate, uh, you know, um, computer equipment. Uh, and tools uh, adapted to this open world because, of course, it's more difficult to uh, to to work in a confidential uh, way. So there is a need uh, to adapt to this uh, open uh, open world and open work, especially for uh, agents with um, um, uh, local law, uh, agent de droit local uh, in uh, in French. And uh, I would just uh, mention to conclude two um, possible, no, three possible uh, structural trends for diplomacy in the medium, uh, uh, in the medium. First, it's of course the digitalization, virtualization. We have, of course, to continue to take this into account, to, to continue our adaptation in terms of tools, in terms of equipment, in terms of modalities of action, uh, to be able to use all um, influenced uh, levers, all influenced tools in a world where now everyone is a potential influencer. And it's not only negative because of course, uh, virtual world also opens a lot of opportunities um, for meetings, it multiplies also uh, contact opportunities. For example, we have organized recently a meeting with all uh, French um, uh, French uh, personnel, French staff in Rome-based agency. They were in Morocco, they were in Ukraine, they were in Haiti, and of course in a, in a, in a non-virtual world, it would not have been possible. Uh, and we will do that with economic actors. We will do that also with young people. Second uh, possible trends, as I say, it's the interconnection of issues, which in my view require from our diplomatic um, uh, personnel uh, more transversality of our modalities of action, maybe with a possible growing importance of scientific and technic technological, technical diplomacy, which is beginning to be at the core now of our diplomacy. So it will be important also to get training on this. And last point, of course, uh, our diplomatic uh, staff, diplomatic personnel uh, will need to be more prepared uh, to crisis and to crisis uh, respond. So I stop there and uh, very happy to take a question and uh, to provide uh, as far as possible answers. Thank you very much, Bruno. Thank you very much, Celine, Ambassador Jürgensen. Uh, I think the, your two interventions were uh, complemented each other very nicely and dovetailed each other, but did not contradict uh, each other. I have a general question that I'd like to ask to both of you. Uh, which is about your assessment, and obviously, uh, Mr. Akasaka, you began to address that, uh, how you, uh, generally speaking, see the Chinese growing role in international organizations. I think uh, Beijing uh, has um, the directorship or the Secretary General of five international organizations, but beyond that, beyond the, uh, beyond the heads, um, can I give you, and of course, I understand, Ambassador, you can say that uh, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, your viewpoint has to address the fact that this is not, uh, this is not an, an entirely private conversation and that you are, even though you are speaking freely, um, uh, you have a particular uh, uh, role in, the, in deploying in, uh, in your official capacity. But uh, precisely because uh, one of you is active and the other uh, is not, maybe you could uh, give us uh, once again, complementary perspectives in general about uh, China's role and influence, uh, genuine contribution to uh, multilateralism, uh, or a primarily uh, a quest for national influence. Perhaps Mr. Akasaka first, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. This uh, uh, issue of uh, growing Chinese influence 
and the presence in international organization is indeed a matter of concern for the Japanese uh, politicians and scholars as well. There have been lots of articles about it. China is currently heading four UN specialized agencies, and China wanted to uh, head the WIPO, World uh, Intellectual Property Organization. So that uh, was uh, 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 what do you call a red line for the United States and others, uh, uh, liberal democracies, and we uh, uh, stopped China uh, from gaining WIPO as well. I pointed out uh, in my first uh, uh, statement that uh, China has been cherry picking international organizations. China is interested in using international organizations so long as they are useful. For example, UN Security Council, very useful as they, China is a permanent member of the Security Council. Or technical organizations like WIPO perhaps and other specialized agencies, they are quite useful. But if you ask whether China is interested in becoming a member of the OECD or a member of the DAC system committee, they would not be interested in that. So China, is the question is whether China is a genuine supporter of multilateralism or China wants to pick here and there and not interested in multilateralism as such if multilateralism is not uh, useful for them. And so we have got to uh, work together together with, the, with China uh, in particularly specialized agencies and technical organizations so long as uh, they can work together with us. But in other areas like Human Rights Council or UN Security Council or other uh, the uh, areas where uh, China shows uh, some uh, disregard of international norms, international law, we have got to be careful and we've got to uh, persuade them to uh, work more or in accordance with international norms and rules of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Selina? Um, thank you very much. And as you said, uh, I will, uh, of course, I, I precision that uh, I'm speaking uh, on my uh, national, well, personal capacity, personal and not national capacity. Um, so, uh, in that regard, uh, I think that Rome uh, is and will be an interesting uh, test case for this uh, uh, Chinese diplomacy on uh, multilateralism because, uh, because we have an uh, international organization, FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, where we have a Chinese director general. He was elected in 2019. Uh, I shall recall that there was a French candidate uh, which was supported by uh, European and other uh, countries, but uh, a Chinese uh, candidate has been uh, elected in, uh, in FAO. So, um, and I, I should say also that um, the uh, that China put a lot of uh, weight uh, in this uh, election, a lot of uh, tools and means uh, in this election, which demonstrates the importance it, it attached to the organization. But I think that it demonstrates also what precisely Mr. Akesaka has just explained, that um, technical specialized organization technical issues are not anymore only technical. They are also political and we have to, uh, we have to, um, to take that on board. Uh, and this is why in my presentation, I said that um, public global goods, technical issues are also, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the place where we 
uh, we see a battle for influence, uh, a growing power competition. This is a fact. Um, so we have to take them to take that on board because um, of course specialized organization have a, a normative role so uh, normative competition is important a wipo for other in international organization and it remains to be to be seen uh, whether uh, china will uh, uh, play um, uh, the game of uh, true and uh, effective uh, multilateralism because of course uh, true and effective multilater multilateralism uh, means uh, accountability means uh, uh, precise uh, and rigorous governance means uh, cooperation with uh, other international organization uh, it means, uh, yes, it means a concrete commitment. So here in Rome, we are at the beginning. Uh, but again, I think that it will be a test case and a reality case for, for that uh, and for China's commitment to uh, effective uh, multilateralism. And of course, uh, you know, other countries are, are watching that uh, and not only uh, Europe and not only uh, Japan. And last point maybe about Rome. Uh, it's interesting because um, it's also, um, I think the only uh, UN uh, place where we have a, a US-China dimension. Because FAO uh, has a Chinese director general and WFP uh, has a, an American executive director. And in some way, you know, it will be interesting to see how it evolves. Um, the next, um, you know, uh, the current executive director, uh, David Beasley, is here until 2022. Uh, the current director general of FAO is here at least until uh, 2023. And it will be interesting to see whether there are some uh, tensions between US and China which are translating in the in those international organization for the time being i i am i don't think i'm um, i see them but that might be uh, in, an interesting case for uh, maybe for research oh thank you very much selena it's actually a very interesting uh, uh, feature of the uh, international io landscape and uh, let's all hope of course that uh, for the for the good of, uh, uh, of uh, the Earth's uh, uh, people, uh, the World Food Program and uh, the FAO will work well together. But at least, as you say, indeed, it will be a good barometer uh, because if they cannot work together on uh, such a critical and, uh, issue, and even as you say, everything is political, and let's hope at least that uh, uh, food, uh, agriculture, and health uh, at least remain. Uh, as much as possible away from uh, uh, other uh, international uh, tensions. I think it's about time for me to thank both of you. I think this was extremely interesting because uh, the combination of uh, your uh, your experience, uh, Mr. Akasaka, and uh, your uh, hands-on uh, expertise, uh, Ambassador Yuan-Sen, was, um, was a very, uh, made for a very interesting session. So thank you very much to both of you, and I give the floor back to uh, Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to to all of you, Bruno and uh, Ambassador Jorgensen and Ambassador Kasaka for participating. I think it was a very fascinating roundtable. Now, as before, we have five minutes, about five minutes break. And then uh, I will come back uh, with uh, for the last round table of uh, that uh, web conference that will begin at 10.45 with uh, Ambassador uh, Tomoaki Ishigaki and uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Bolo Paloma. So I will ask them to connect uh, uh, in a few minutes so we can begin the third round table. And I will ask both of you, uh, Kasaka, Ambassador Akasaka, Ambassador Jorgensen, to disconnect yourself. <laughs> and disappear from the screen. Thank you very much again. It Thank was very, a very good session. Thank you very much. Thank Merci. you. Thank you.
Merci. Merci Valérie. So, thank you very much for being here. And uh, now we will, I will moderate the third uh, roundtable of uh, this uh, web uh, conference, which is uh, the title of the roundtable is the role of economic partnerships in the post COVID recovery. Uh, the roundtable will uh, will be for about uh, 45 minutes. We will finish at uh, 11.30 French time. And uh, each speaker will have 15, about 15 minutes to, to make a presentation, but I will come back to that uh, later. So first, a few words of presentation. Uh, this week, and especially being based in Japan now, this week and the last, we saw uh, an important activity involving the United States and its Asian partners with first uh, a quad meeting, then two plus two meetings with Japan and Tokyo, and lastly, uh, on Friday, exchange of view with China, between China and the United States in Alaska. And in all these meetings, two concepts uh, were strongly reasserted, and we mentioned them in the two previous roundtables too, which were the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific and also the support for multilateralism. And this is a, a very welcome departure, especially for the US from previous years, and that may facilitate a, a trilateral dialogue between Japan, Europe, and the United States on very, these very important issues. These values are particularly, particularly shared sorry, by Japan and the European Union, and it was discussed in the first roundtable, as was also mentioned at the EU uh, foreign minister meeting, to which for the first time, Mr. Motegi, the Japanese uh, foreign minister, also participated uh, in a web uh, webinars. And in, uh, in, not, not in presence, I mean. And these shared values and principles, including free trade and support for the rule of law, also uh, translated into uh, very important trade partnerships. And as uh, Celine Jorgensen just said, everything now is not only technical, it is also very political in the world we are living in. So, um, as I said, this uh, third concluding roundtable will focus on the role of economic partnerships in the post-COVID recovery. So we have two excellent speakers uh, for this roundtable. Uh, Mr. Ishigaki, Ambassador Ishigaki, I should say, uh, Tomoaki will speak. I'm, I'm not Ambassador. <laughs> oh, not, yet, not yet, very soon, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> He's Director of the Economic Policy Division of the Economic Affairs Bureau of the Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he was formerly Deputy Cabinet Secretary of Public Affairs at the Prime Minister Office in Japan. But before that, he also occupied many important functions uh, covering multilateral and bilateral negotiations. That's why his participation is extremely important today too, including the World Trade Organizations, Arms Trade Treaty at the UN, on climate change. And Tomoaki Ishigaki is also the author of important articles, including one called uh, Japan's Proactive Multilateralism, the UN's Arms Trade Treaty um, of 2013 for uh, the View Asian Survey. Uh, and then we have uh, Mr. or Professor Bruno Aloma. He is an economist, he is a former high level official at the French Ministry of Finance, Finance sorry, and the European Commission. And uh, Bruno Alomar is currently uh, both a consultant, but he also teaches at Sciences Po. So, as I said initially, each will speak for approximately 10 15 minutes or according to what they want to allow to that uh, presentation. And I will begin by asking uh, Mr. Ishigaki three questions. Uh, and as uh, it was uh, said, said before, the presentations will be followed by a short Q&A se uh, session. And you can ask uh, your questions using the chat button uh, at the bottom of your screen. And I will uh, moderate uh, these questions. So let me turn now to uh, our first speaker, Mr. Uh, Ishigaki Tomoaki. 
So my first questions would be, what impact the Japan-EU European uh, Partnership Agreement, economic, sorry, partnership agreement has made since its entry into force in 2019? Can I start responding that? Yes. Uh, first yes. of all, thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for this great opportunity. And it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be acquainted with Professor Alomar. Uh, yes, it's a bit strange that while uh, you, Valerie, and I are both in Tokyo, but we cannot you know, meet each other. And hopefully, such kind of situation would uh, improve as we overcome this uh, pandemic. So having said, um, of course, I will be speaking from my office in my official capacity, but please note that some of the views might be slightly personal, but uh, you have raised a very uh, profound question. First, uh, with regard to the progress of this uh, bilateral trade agreement between Japan and the European Union, I think for, it is important first to note that not, not to see this issue in, uh, is agreement in isolation, I think we should recall the dramatic development of the bilateral relationship between Japan and the European Union over the last few years. And EPA is just one example. It should be also considered in um, uh, the broader context of the strategic partnership agreement, as well as the broadening of the security relationship between the two uh, partners. But having said, uh, just to focus first on the uh, progress made under the Japan EU EPA, as you have pointed out, Valerie, uh, there was a, a bilateral consultation at the minister's level just only a few weeks ago. But uh, just to uh, go back in time, there has already been some tangible uh, trade benefits between the two partners after the entry into force of the uh, agreement. I could just name a few, which, for example, is the export of Japanese automobiles, beef and sake, the Japanese rice-based liquor, have increased uh, 14, 35% and 5% respectively in the export from Japan to European Union. Whereas the European export of wine, of course, and the clothing have also rose uh, 13 and 2% uh, respectively compared to the previous year. Of course, we all know that the uh, global economy has slowed down uh, because of the pandemic. But nonetheless, I still see a very robust sales of the European products in Japan, as well as uh, these you know, uh, good business opportunities cr cr created by the uh, agreement between uh, for the Japanese companies uh, and investors created by this agreement. So on this uh, ministerial meeting that you mentioned, uh, Valerie, uh, the two ministers, Foreign Minister Motegi and the Trade Commissioner, uh, Mr. Dombrovskis have uh, welcomed the addition of two, uh, uh, 28 new names uh, to be protected as geographical indications. And I think it is also worthwhile to note that they have also shared views on further cooperating, cooperation on key global issues such as the COVID-19 pandemic, green and digital uh, uh, economy slash society, as well as the WTO uh, reform. And also, maybe we'll come up a bit later in your response to further questions, but they agreed to initiate exploratory talks uh, to reassess the need of inclusion of uh, provisions uh, of the free flow of data into the Japan-EU uh, Economic Partnership Agreement. Also, uh, it is worthwhile no noticing and uh, noting that uh, the, uh, the emphasis was given to ensure the smooth business transaction for the Japanese businesses and, and uh, investors, especially after the Brexit. And uh, also one of the key issues that I cover right now in my office is to, to lift any kind of a trade uh, import restrictions for the Japanese uh, agricultural products. Unfortunately, there are some measures still uh, uh, employed in the European uh, Union, and we very much hope that based on science, those measures would be lifted. So uh, I think, as I said, also we should look at this you know, overall context of the bilateral uh, partnership on political, economic, and security cooperations. So the bilateral consultations also on strategic partnership agreement took place early, uh, in uh, late February. And I think in this area, uh, the conversation also ranged from the COVID responses, which also have some security 
applications, as well as the cooperation on the concept of the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And I believe that there's an ample opportunity for the two partners. So I think that was a very good opportunity in these two meetings to take stock of the progress. So I, I will stop here. I don't know if you want to stop here, but maybe I could raise another question uh, concerning uh, gl more global issues. As you mentioned, uh, this partnership between the EU and Japan has to be put in context. And in the context of increasing relationship and increasing uh, strategic vision, of course, in Japan, but also on the part of Europe. So if I just pick, uh, it's not directly related, of course, but maybe you would like to contribute uh, on global issues such as COVID, of course, which is uh, an urgent issue for, for, for all the, of, uh, I mean, at the global level on health, including uh, vac vaccine cooperation, but also you were working as you, uh, as I mentioned, on climate change and the possible reform of WTO. Uh, would you have some uh, points to, to add to your first presentation? Of course. Yes, thank you for the, those uh, key points. Uh, there's no doubt that Japan and European Union have many areas that they could pragmatically con uh, contribute for the safe and uh, equitable access of vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. One of the most recent developments is that uh, at the G7 video conference uh, just took place on February 19th, uh, Japan, the European Union with other leaders uh, confirmed that the importance of, this, uh, of the uh, uh, access of vaccination, not only to their own citizens, but also throughout the global community. There's always a, there has always been a uh, active uh, cooperation in area, multilateral cooperation in areas like uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, tool accelerators and its COVID uh, COVAX facilities. This is a mechanism to ensure that the developing countries can also uh, gain access to the vaccination. And these are something that the, uh, the leaders, the G7 leaders have confirmed that they should be uh, strengthening their uh, cooperation and Japan and European Union uh, leaders have also uh, stressed these points. On climate change, of course, I feel very strongly about this matter because I was involved in the uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement from COP22 to COP24, where I worked clear, very closely with our European colleagues of both the European Commission, French and other uh, governments. And in this area, of course, we all know that uh, there's a gain, regain momentum of the implement of tackling the climate uh, crisis with the U U.S. return to the Paris Agreement. Uh, this would certainly increase the impetus for the much more aggressive global action. And we also uh, are keenly aware of the sequence of the timeline of this year. Uh, the, Europe, uh, the UK will be uh, chairing, uh, uh, chairing the G7 in June in Cornwall, uh, followed by the Italian presidency of the G20. And immediately after the uh, Italian uh, presidency of G20 in October, uh, the COP26 will take place in uh, Glasgow, UK. And so this is a great opportunity to sort of reaffirm the commitment on both sides, Japan and the European Union, for much more robust climate action. And of course, in this area, there's uh, many area, pragmatic areas that uh, the two parties can uh, cooperate. For example, hydrogen uh, technology, Sets and also a very innovative uh, ways of disruptive uh, uh, technologies uh, needs to be employed in order to achieve the uh, 1.5 degree target. And uh, I'm also in charge of 2025 Expo. Um, I always wear this uh, badge uh, <laughs> and to promote. But this is seen, and while it only takes, and it may take, you find that you may find that it takes place far ahead in 2025. But of course, when we think about the 2030 target for the social, uh, sustainable development goals and other uh, long-term targets for the climate action, uh, the key innovations should be already shown at the 2025 Expo. And we were very much look forward for the European uh, the partners to show up and, show, and provide a showcase for such innovation. And you also mentioned uh, last point on the WTO reform. Uh, we all know that the there's a breeze of fresh air after the election of new Director General Okonjo uh, from Nigeria. 
uh, the first African female uh, director general to lead this organization, which will also give a good momentum for the reform of the WTO. Japan and Europe have been working closely in area of all kinds of reforms in the WTO, uh, I, it, uh, and also on the areas such as the appellate body and also issues of subsidies. So we very much hope that in this difficult environment of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there's a much more, say, impetus for the two parties to cooperate. And I think WTO and also multilateral trading system is a very key, uh, uh, say, our most appropriate venue to uh, strengthen such cooperation. And I have a last uh, question that maybe just you could uh, explain uh, a concept uh, regarding connectivity. You mentioned connectivity, partnership plus uh, initiatives in Japan. This is extremely important, connectivity between the EU and Asia, what it means. And also the concept that China, uh, Japan has uh, presented at the Osaka uh, G20 meeting, which is called the free flow of data. Uh, Celine Jorgensen just before mentioned the fact that in common co global goods so there are no limits between you know actions of so certain I mean transparency governance are absolute necessity. So I think that the, the concept of free flow of data also is included in, in, into that collective thinking, multilateral thinking about what should be the new world uh, that we are trying to build in that extremely difficult context that we are uh, in now. Certainly. So uh, the DFFT, the Data Free Flow with Trust, was first introduced by Prime, then Prime Minister Abe at the World Economic Forum um, uh, Conference in Davos in 2019. And uh, Prime Minister Abe stated, and I quote, we must on one hand be able to put uh, our personal data and data embodying intellectual property, national security intelligence under a very careful uh, protection. While on the other hand, we must un enable the free flow of medical, industrial, traffic, and other most useful non-personal anonymous data uh, to see no borders, uh, and repeat, no borders, end quote. So the basic concept of the G DFFT or data free flow with trust can be described as a vision where a massive data can be used to maximize uh, individual business and social benefits while ensuring the safety and security of the network or system against malicious or unauthorized uh, users or entities. Uh, we all know that the European Union has set uh, out its standards of data usage through the general data protection regulations, and I think it has a major impact of the way that the business is now conducted. So, I, and also uh, the countries like the United States or, the, or Japan also introduced their own regulations or ideas, but I think it is very important to harmonize and find a common ground, as you have pointed out, and Celine, my dear friend, has also uh, emphasized that this is a global um, a com a common good. So I think the big data has an enormous potential that can improve our way of living from medical health, uh, urban traffic, and energy consumption, and this would allow us to achieve a more sustainable society. But we also know that uh, such kind of uh, the collection of such kind of personal data can use the potential risk of being exploited by authoritarian regimes or others to control its population. So it is very important for Japan and European Union, which you know, share a very you know, fundamental values, uh, such as the uh, basic human rights, rule of law, uh, freedom of speech, uh, personal privacy, and respect for innovation and business enter, uh, entrepreneurship to find ways to have a solid discussion to ensure such platform to, uh, uh, to prosper. One of the venue is the e-commerce negotiations at the WTO, and there, as you have pointed out, Valerie, uh, ongoing discussions in other areas where Japan you know, consider as a uh, Osaka track after the G20. We are looking forward to pushing this agenda also at this year's G7, as you know, the European leaders also keen to discuss digital as well as green. And I hope that there are many other you know, opportunities for the two parties to uh, cooperate. So I hope that answers your question.
Thank you very much for these very complete and comprehensive answers to my three questions. And now uh, I will give the, the mic or the floor, <laughs> it's uh, the distant floor, to uh, uh, Mr. Bruno Aloma. And you have uh, uh, also about 15 minutes to maybe focusing on the EU, EU uh, possibilities and potentials, but also uh, limitations, and eventually, if you want to comment on some Mr. Ishigaki uh, points. So, Bruno Aloma, this is for you to speak. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to thank the uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique and Mrs. Uh, Valérie Niquet for giving me the opportunity to participate to this, um, this uh, webinar. Uh, of course, it's uh, a great honor to be uh, uh, exchanging with you, Mr. Uh, Ishigaki Tomaoki. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I, I, I will, uh, in, for, for a few minutes, um, uh, try to uh, expose my view of the EU situation as it is now. Uh, because knowing what it is now is extremely important to know what we, could, what we meaning Japan on the one hand, and uh, the European Union can do uh, on uh, the other hand. So uh, <clears throat> I think, um, um, sorry, excuse me. Excuse me for that. I actually not at my office, but I I'm at home and I'm not in Japan, but I'm in Brussels. <laughs> um, I would divide my my presentation, if you agree, uh, in three points. Um, first, uh, where was the European Union uh, before this terrible crisis started? How it has managed uh, this this crisis and in a third time, um, what what view can we can we can we have for uh, for the future? Of course, when we when we talk about Europe, we should always keep in mind that there is on the one hand the European Union itself, the way it works, its tools, and as Mrs. Nikke, as you said, I've been working for uh, the European Union, the, the Commission for, for a while. Uh, but of course, uh, the European Union is also, and even more, uh, the economies of the member states, the 27 member states of this uh, uh, European Union. And in between these member states and uh, the European Union, the 27, of course, there is the big animal in, in the class, which is the Eurozone. So I will very much uh, uh, try to focus on the Eurozone issue because it's the core of uh, the European Union. Even though, of course, the commercial uh, uh, European policy covers the 27 member states. Uh, my first point would be to say, if we look back, uh, that the European Union as a whole uh, entered this very terrible crisis again in, uh, I must say, a quite difficult situation um, at both level, at uh, member states level and at the EU level. If I very briefly uh, uh, focus on uh, the member states, of course, I would not talk about the 27 because that would be far too much. Uh, but let's look at Italy, for instance. Just one figure. GDP per person in Italy, base 100 in 2000, was the same as in 2019, which means that Italy, this is an OECD figure, it means that Italy roughly stopped for two decades. Um, if we look at France, my country, um, it has never managed over the last years to, for instance, restore its budget and external deficits, even though some reforms were, were, were made. If I take Spain, Spain, for instance, has always had and still has inter alia a terrible problem with youth unemployment. 
I could go on. So that's my first point. Member states entered the pandemic uh, uh, fragilized. Um, but so was the European Union as a global institution. Uh, of course, if we try to be a, a, bit, a bit positive, some progresses have been made over the last 10 years. For instance, the banking union uh, uh, has made a lot of progress. And I could quote another pro uh, other progresses. Nevertheless, if we look, look back and consider the last 10 years, it has been in Europe, as far as the European Union is concerned, a succession of problems. Uh, the sovereign crisis of the Eurozone, um, repeated problems between the French and the Germans, uh, which have been and remain the very center of uh, uh, the European Union. And of course, last but not least, uh, Brexit, which is, remain and will be, in my view, a catastrophe for the, for the European Union. Nobody really can measure so far. So back one year ago, I would say that the European Union um, and its member states were not probably in a, a very good shape. Now, how has this crisis been managed, um, both from member states and uh, uh, um, um, from an, an EU organization perspective? Well, for member states, um, again, it's, it's, it's always a bit, a bit easy to criticize afterwards, knowing we knew and et cetera and so on and so forth. But if we take a global picture, it's difficult to say, in my view, that the European member states manage the crisis better than other places in the world. The idea is not to make a ranking, but overall, I think we would, always, uh, we would all agree in Europe that uh, um, this could have been better. And because we know the link between uh, the pandemic issue and the economic issue, it has resulted in a, a terrible recession we haven't seen uh, except in war times. If I again quote briefly some figures, uh, uh, um, uh, France would have a recession of minus 8.2%. Um, uh, um, uh, Spain and Italy would have a recession above 10%. And if I take the Eurozone as a whole, it has been a recession, well, it should be a recession of minus 6.5%. If I take France, for instance, and I compare what has happened this time and what happened with the Lehman Brothers crisis, after the Lehman Brothers crisis, the GDP contraction was 3.9%. So it's more than the double. So it has been really a rough, 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 rough time. If I now look at the European Union as an organization, and again, to be a bit, a bit positive, there has been a series of huge efforts who has been made on the budget side and on the monetary side. Uh, if I look at the budget side, you might uh, remember uh, the, that the European for the first time decided to create the so-called recovery plan, seven, 700, uh, five, uh, 750 uh, uh, hundred, uh, uh, billion euros. And as far as the uh, um, ECB is concerned, a, a new program of 1.8 trillion euros has been decided and it's, it's still ongoing. So we can say that the European Union has had a reaction. Nevertheless, um, many principles of the European Union, the core European principles, have been damaged over the last years. One of them, of course, is uh, uh, free circulation inside the European Union. Uh, and we have seen that facing uh, this tragedy, um, national reflexes very often came first and cooperation with the other member states came after. Um, also, and like in 2008, I was working at the Commission in 2008, um, we, we have touched here uh, one of the very problem of the European Union, which is that the magnitude of the tools the European Union has remains very limited 
economically speaking, compared to uh, the tools national member national uh, uh, member states still have. So there is a discrepancy uh, that remains extremely strong between what the European Union might want to do and what the European Union might do again out of the monetary uh, 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 tools, which are indeed extremely important. Um, for, for this reason, and this is the third and last point of my presentation, um, how can we look at the future? Um, I would say three things. First, that the problems of the Eurozone, the very uh, fundamental problems of the Eurozones remain, and even more uh, uh, um, have increased. The major problem of the Eurozone is divergent, divergence between the member states. The, the Eurozone cannot survive if national trajectories, national situations are too different. Uh, and because some member states entered in the crisis in a better shape than the others, of course, they will be in a situation to help their own companies in such a way that they will get out faster than the others. others. Everybody is aware of that. I mean, the German government is very aware of that. Uh, 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 a thousand uh, Europe govern governments are also very aware of that. But it's a fact. Uh, also, we should not disguise that uh, the European Union project, it's not only an economic issue, it's also a question of politics, a question of values. And we cannot disguise that the split between Eastern countries and Western countries on the question of values is very strong. And again, it increases. So for the Eurozone and the European Union as a whole, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult also uh, if you look at the member states. Because at the end of the day, we should always remember that uh, the, Euro the, the Euro project is not only a, a question of values and polit politics, it's also a question of economics. And if, if we look, look at the potential growth of Europe out of the pandemic crisis, the spread with the United States, which, which already existed, I say the United States because it's the zone which is most comparable to uh, Europe, and the expression les états unis d'Europe, the United States of Europe. The spread between potential growth in the US and potential growth in Europe as a whole has widened. And this is, of course, a tremendous problem. Last, and to be a bit more positive, and I will uh, uh, finish with that, um, we should keep in mind that if Europe is big, uh, situations inside Europe, Europe vary. And some member states do very well. Just an example, uh, Republic of Czechia, which entered uh, the European Union in 2004, after such a long, a long time under, uh, behind the, uh, the iron curtail, uh, is now richer than Spain, on a GDP per person basis, which means that some member states do and will do better uh, uh, in, in the coming years. Uh, and last, if, um, if I may conclude, conclude like that, um, um, I think the openness of the European Union to the world, in particular through free, free trade, is not so far really damaged. I think uh, the European Union is still committed to free trade. But we should never forget that a zone is all the more committed to free trade that it feels it, it, it's, its interest to be committed to free trade. So, and maybe I've been a little long, I, don't, I apologize for that, but the very, situation of the European Union as a whole, to which extent the people of the European Union have the feeling that the European Union is strong, is a key element for politicians to keep on with free trade 
and a free Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much for your, so, in a way, sobering, but also a very rich and stimulating uh, presentation. Um, I am not an economist myself, so it's extremely difficult for me to raise technical questions. However, uh, I have been, been following these debates, and particularly since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. And there have been a very strong debate regarding notions like, you mentioned uh, free trade, and this is something which is extremely important. This is part of the basic values, uh, shared values, that, for instance, Japan and the EU, but not only, of course, uh, when you speak of that liberal world order, that is uh, sometimes threatened, but also that Japan and the EU intend to defend on the US, of course, on all like-minded countries. Uh, but free trade has been under attack, not only because of the administration of President Trump, when President Trump was President of the United States and he, he was focusing on America first, but also because there have been a lot of attacks from, um, you know, in, we were speaking at the in, beginning of that conference of compliance with rules. Um, we must recognize also that inside the EU, some have doubts about common rules, common norms. Outside of the EU too, we are confronting liberal democracies, other countries who have their own doubts about the value of these uh, common rules that are values that everybody should share. And these are under attack. So I am wondering, and also my last point is, uh, we spoke about the reform of WTO. I was reading recently papers published in Japan in the years 2000 about multilateralism preparing for that conference. It's interesting because at that time, uh, multilateralism for Japan equate exactly WTO on trade. And not, it was not going beyond that very much because uh, Japan at that time was still very much not inward looking, but focusing on being an economic power. And this has changed a lot. Uh, but uh, still, uh, since then, we saw a proliferation, I would not say minilateralism, mini of course, because there are huge regions. Uh, you mentioned EU, uh, Japan, economic partnership. Uh, there is also the CTPP, which is also a huge region between uh, Asia and across the Pacific, and now the UK would like to join too. So do you, do you see any future for the big uh, global multilateral organization on trade uh, compared with these, uh, you know, smaller but extremely strong and important uh, sub organization like the uh, economic partnerships or the CTPP and their attractiveness to, you know, but at, it's not completely multilateral covering a global order, but it's more adjusted to the necessities of huge, very important, but also leading trade regions in the world. Maybe uh, we do not have a lot of time, but maybe uh, we could uh, begin with you. Um, uh, Ishigaki-san to give a few words. We, it will be also your conclusion. And then, uh, Monsieur Alomar, if you want to conclude also. Sure. On this yes. Theme. I felt that uh, Professor Alomar's closing remarks about one country may be doing slightly better than the other in European Union. At the same time, the need of certain level of confidence among the people in the system is something that is not only you know, relevant to the European Union, but also in this whole world, you know, when everyone is going through the, the uh, pandemic crisis. Because one of the strengths, in my view, is uh, of the, the you know, uh, liberal democracies, as you have mentioned, is that all the ideas are tested in a very transparent manner. And sometimes people cast doubt on, for example, whether the national responses for the COVID uh, crisis is uh, adequate or not, whether the system is better, one system is better than the other. But this has been always discussed and tested in the open uh, platform. And because of that, yes, we struggle. Because of that, 
there might be a very uh, top-down, uh, say, yeah, authoritarian approach in this matter. But I think because of that, uh, we would be able to test, review, and also adjust. And I think that is something that we always learn from each other in this system. And I would connect that to the question uh, you raised on uh, Valerie on the uh, validity of the multilateral trading system. I think over the last two decades, you talked about the paper written in Japan in 2000. On that two, two decades, as uh, Professor Aloma pointed out, yes, there was a global financial crisis. And there was also a stalemate of the, uh, field, uh, the trade liberalization at the WTO. And I think key countries like the European Union, Japan, and US have also found more pragmatic way of adopting that, adapting to that change. And that is certainly, for example, the uh, economic partnership between Japan and the European Union. But that's, that does not mean that uh, the two parties have given up or ad abandoned the concept of the WTO multilateral trading system. As Professor Aloma said, the, the free trade system or the ways that it works is still relevant. And I think that is something that everyone is fully aware. We tend to forget that the, double, the, the free trade agreement is based on the premise of all the key principles under the WTO. And I think that is the way that maybe the economies or the countries would evolve. And I think that is how uh, Japan and European Union would be able to uh, learn from respective lessons and also to bring new ideas to make the system more, uh, say, vibrant. So I would you know, uh, also keen to hear from Professor Alokma's uh, point of view. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Aloma, if you want to conclude, uh, you have uh, two minutes to, to give your views about uh, that very vast <laughs> issue <laughs> that you raised. <laughs> Just so the, uh, Thank you very much. Um, well, very briefly, I think, uh, well, I share, I share uh, uh, your point of view. Um, what I would say is that um, we should be pragmatic. Um, nobody, I think, disputes the fact that uh, 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 multilateralism, as far as trade is concerned, in the years coming will not be the same as it was the last uh, 20, 30 years. It will be different. Uh, at the same time, to, to take an example, the fact that the, 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 the United Kingdom leaves the European Union doesn't mean that geography is not geography and that uh, the UK will not have to cooperate uh, because the, it's just a question of pragmatism again and, and interest. So um, uh, in, in this regard, we should not, I think, dispute also the fact that yes, the WTO was in a kind of a crisis of course, there is a new head, and I wish her the very best luck for the, the, the best of all of us. But we should not oppose, in my view, uh, to keep on trying working at uh, uh, the widest level, and at the same time, trying to find on a, 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 smaller, a smaller basis agreements that are the very best for the parties, and then which may be, be proposed and, 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 and extended um, at, the, at, the rest of, uh, at the rest of the world. Um, in this context, well, I think one of the key issues will be uh, um, to which extent, as far as Europe is concerned, I'm not talking about Europe, I know, um, uh, the populations will be uh, 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 convinced uh, uh, of the uh, interest of, of free trade. Um, and of course, this changes over time. If you take Germany and France, for instance, um, for uh, the very last, uh, uh, between 1975 and in 2015, exactly 40 years, France was the first trade partner of Japan. Since 2016, the first partner of Japan is China. Of course, it has an influence on the way the French and the Germans together push for a certain type of uh, 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 EU-wide uh, uh, commercial policy. So uh, uh, I think, and I will conclude like that, um, uh, uh, we will have to be more flexible, uh, very wise, um, and very pragmatic if we want uh, uh, free trade to keep on uh, in, in forms that cannot be the ways we have seen and known before, even though we would wish it to be different, but we should take the world as it is. 
Thank you very much. So this, uh, this will conclude uh, not only this roundtable, but also the web conference that uh, we organized today in the framework of the Japan program of FRS. Uh, it has been going on, as Xavier Basco mentioned, uh, in the first roundtable since 2016, and I hope it will go on. Uh, we have so many things to discuss together, to exchange between France, Japan, but also EU and Japan. And for those of you who could not follow all of the conference, I know it's, it's quite long, it's two hours and a half uh, on web, so it's, it, it may be difficult, but it will be put on the YouTube uh, channel of FRS, so you, will, you can watch it part by part on, in one set, uh, cooking like I do very often. <laughs> I cook and watch <laughs> webinars. So it's, uh, it's very interesting uh, mixture of, you know, reality, pragmatism, and more elevated <laughs> way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, it will be possible. And it, I think it's a good way to, to watch at leisure. Uh, the debates and think about them and go on with our exchanges. So thank you and goodbye to uh, both of you, but also to all of the, those who followed the conference, uh, this conference to, to the end. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Merci. Bye. Bye. Bye.